So even if you find yourself as the leader or the owner of your business, we need to make sure we're not getting complacent about continuing to be on our growth edge or thinking we have it all figured out because the environment will change, the circumstances will change, the people around us are going to change. And so we need to keep growing and being open to change, open to trying different things and maybe having it not go perfectly every time. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a fun one. Our returning guest is the CEO of Well Balanced Accountants, and she's a leadership development coach, training facilitator specializing in working with accounting and finance professionals and progressive firms. Erin Daber, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Aaron, I'd love to know what's been going on since the last time you were on the show. Yeah, it's been about a year since I was on last, and things have been great. My business has been growing. I've had the chance to work with a lot of owners, whether they own a and run a bookkeeping practice or large accounting firm owners. Really, a, a lot of cool people have come into my practice who are looking to level up their leadership and and who are struggling to navigate some of the challenges that the profession has been throwing our way these days. So that's been a lot of fun and a big challenge. And I think the other really new and exciting thing since we've spoke last is I launched a brand new offering for my clients called the Remote Readiness Program. Since so many firms are going remote or at least hybrid, hiring people that don't live near where they live, I created this offering to help firms get ready to hire, retain, and engage their remote team members. So very cool. Super excited about that. What I was finding is a lot of organizations were hiring remote and treating them exactly the same as how they would operate with an in-person employee and it wasn't working out on either side. So we're excited to be rolling that out with different organizations. Oh, very cool. Very Mm -hmm. cool. I'd love to hear you. So you've been working with lots of business owners over the last year. I'd love to hear some of the challenges that you've been encountering and, and, uh, and how you've been tackling those. Well, I think retention is the biggest one. Retention and hiring. So just a a lack of a pool of people to pull from and maybe dwindling, I don't know if it's motivation or, you know, just a lack of excitement about the people who are out there. That's been a big challenge. So we really have been working with owners to make sure that they're really doing everything that they can to engage and train and develop the team members that they have and keep them happy in their organizations so that they don't have to go into the hiring pool and try to find new people and start the process all over again. But we have been doing a lot of work also with firms that are hiring on expanding that pool by hiring remote, but that does cause some challenges if you haven't had a remote employee before. Yes, absolutely. So when you're when you're talking about retaining, I'd love to know some of the things that they they were just not doing right and then what happened? What did they what did they change? Well, I think one of the focuses, one of the big ones and the ch- most challenging to address is being stuck in an old mindset, old school mindset, or this is what has always worked for us. So I don't know why it's not working now and sort of an unwillingness to change their approach. And so that starts with recognizing that this new generation of people or even 
previous generations of folks that have now lived through the pandemic and saw what it's like to have flexibility to work remote, work from home. We can't go, we're not going to go back to the way it used to be, right? We have to accept where we are and explore how to move forward from here. So a lot of it, a lot of what they were doing wrong was almost hoping or wishing for how it used to be. Well, I wish I could just get them to work 80 hours a week, or I wish I could just get them to come into the office every day. So we've been working a lot on building trust with their workers to be remote or have that flexibility to maybe have a hybrid schedule, um, empowering their team members to take more ownership and responsibility. They don't want as much oversight. They don't want to be micromanaged. But sometimes when we get scared as business owners, that's the default. We sort of go to micromanaging or getting too involved in the process. So I think the key to all of it is making sure that we as the leaders are continuing to develop also so that we're not holding ourselves back from evolving with the business. Interesting. Very. And and are the clients that you work with it, taking on that leadership role and, and moving into that position of leadership? I'd love to hear a little bit about that and your perspective of what that's like. It's not everyone. I was just on a recent podcast where we were talking about control, right? And also a leader, someone who starts a business has uh, different characteristics and team that would work with them. So sometimes a new leader or new business owner, someone even been in for a while has a challenge going from, okay, I'm doing things on my own. I'm doing, I'm getting things done to, I need to empower and motivate, inspire all that good stuff with my team. What, what, what kind of things do you see? We, I think it's first and foremost, recognizing that we're never done growing. So even if you find yourself as the leader or the owner of your business, we need to make sure we're not getting complacent about continuing to be on our growth edge or thinking we have it all figured out because the environment will change, the circumstances will change, the people around us are going to change. And so we need to keep growing and being open to change, open to trying different things and maybe having it not go perfectly every time. Really sort of being in the experiment of it. Those leaders that I found have been doing the best and really have thrived during this time are those that have been a bit easier on themselves, a little bit more compassionate with being willing to try and fail or try something and make a change and try again. That's um, cool. Yeah, I think that's, that's cool. really important. And uh, just being able to, to adapt and pivot quickly. And have you seen anything like, you know, if our listener is listening now, hopefully they are, <laughs> <laughs> then what is it that the shift was there is there shifts or what causes those shifts where it's like okay you know what before i was maybe not comfortable with that mm -hmm. and i've done these things it's going to help me relax a little bit into that the world isn't going to come apart at the seams if i am not completely successful with this next this next project yeah. Well, I mean, you talked about control. I think that's a big one that a lot of people fall into. They also fall into uh, fear of failure as, you know, another sort of mindset or pattern that holds us back. So in terms of shifting those behaviors, this is going to sound too good to be true, but honestly, one of the things mm -hmm. that I think works best is taking really good care of yourself. So we don't do a good job of that in this profession, but the more we take care of ourselves, the more we are sort of building our energy reserves and um, honoring our time and energy, the better we are going to be in the face of challenges. If we're exhausted and burned out and we're just holding on by the skin of our teeth and then a challenge comes our way, we're probably not going to handle it very well. So that's one of the first things I work with owners on is how are you doing taking care of yourself and what else can we put in place to really build your energy and source you for the day? Because that's going to just help you with your day in general, but especially if we're now layering on trying to let go of old habits and mindsets that are really deeply ingrained. That takes practice. So 
you know, if it were working on something like letting go of perfection or control, an easy way to go about that is to start, we want to start small and think about embracing an experiment, right? Let's just try something else. And again, sort of releasing the pressure, having compassion with yourself as you take on something new and embracing change. And instead of focusing only on all of the things that can go wrong or all of the reasons that this won't work, getting into the practice and getting into the habit of looking at the possibilities, looking at the potential when this goes well or when this change is implemented, how it's going to help you, how it's going to help your business or help your team. So focusing more on the positive than the negative can give us something to work towards. Mm, I love the the word experiment as well. It's mm-hmm. kind of a somewhat freeing, frees up from the, the outcome. It's yes. We don't know what the outcome is in an experiment. We have a hypotheses, but whether or not it does or doesn't happen as part of the experiment. Mm-hmm. And and also the opportunity to call the experiment a failure or a success. Mm-hmm. And if it's a failure, well, guess what? New experiment. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the key, freeing it up. I think we're very black and white generally in accounting and it's very easy. We're also typically pretty hard on ourselves. So in practicing something new, I think we tend more towards, oh, that was a failure. It didn't work out well. But in an experiment, some of it may work and some of it may not work as expected. And then you can go back and make the changes necessary. Mm, love it. You work with a lot of different firms, a lot of different people, characteristics, I'm sure. I'd be really curious to know if you notice any characteristics or behaviors or things that they're doing that separate them from the others. I'm sure you have a whole host of of uh, success levels or progress levels that people are making. Mm-hmm. What things do you notice? Well, I think, again, being on their growth edge, recognizing that there's always more to learn, there's always a different way to approach things and not getting stagnant. And a lot of that also really requires doing that deep inner work to identify where am I holding myself back, right? Where am I now becoming the bottleneck? A lot of times we do the, well, we're always doing the best we can with the tools that we have. And those Mm -hmm. tools generally work very well for us up to a certain level. And what I find is the leaders that are most successful can recognize when those old approaches that used to work aren't working anymore. And they're willing to get some support or experiment again with something different to keep moving forward. I would say also the best leaders really work to build relationships and trust with their team members. They recognize that they can't do it all themselves and that in fact, they're probably not the best person to do everything in their business. So I think those two things are key and, and of course, self-care. They take really good care of themselves to show up as their best self every day. Mm-hmm. That's a big one. And I, I'd say that that alone, just thinking of the type of work, especially after COVID, more, it's not like we're doing more out of the office work after COVID or during COVID. Mm-hmm. It was already a heavy, heavy duty in, in the office, in front of the computer, a lot of the times where that can, that can grind on that can be that that environment can be all that one experiences and so that can be trying on mental health and also your just a physicality of exercise and getting into a mindset that is empowering and Mm. ready to take on new experiments absolutely yeah i think our profession doesn't do a great job of promoting mental health or, you know, I know certainly how I was brought up in public accounting was very much this culture of grind, burn yourself out. And then after this short period of time, you get to breathe again and it'll be great and you recharge and then we just do it all over again. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately during COVID that changed and it just seems to always be busy now. So in some ways, I think that the pandemic forced our profession to adapt. And that's one of the areas that we're finding we can't keep doing it that way. We can't keep operating in that same approach of just grinding it out and working really hard for these short bursts. 
because those bursts aren't there. It's just one long marathon now. So we have to get better at taking good care of ourselves for our sake and for our team. Absolutely. Absolutely. They they need us at our best. Hmm. And that's maybe a good question then. You talked earlier about virtual teams. I'd love to hear some of the, the, the notes that you've been picking up on the differences between the in in office or even local mm-hmm. to an outsourced or or overseas team. Well, outsourced or overseas, I think would be different. I think of those as a little bit different than someone who is in Wisconsin when your business is in Texas, right? Mm-hmm. So just a, a remote worker. So maybe I'll address those separately. So for outsourced, um, I think the big challenge that I see with leaders, and this is what I mean by outsource is offshoring, right? Yep. To, uh, to a company, they may not be offshore, but one of those bigger conglomerates of resources. So one of the places where I find leaders get held back there is limiting themselves in what they think those groups can handle. So they can only handle the bottom 5% most easy projects that we do, which is not necessarily true. They've been at this a long time. They've got good resources. So I would challenge you to push the boundaries of what could actually be handed off to outsourced. Um, A lot of times that's our own fear or our own limitation that we're putting on it, not necessarily a limitation of the outsourced team member. Alongside that, though, The other challenge is we send work off and we don't provide adequate or clear enough training and expectations. So then it comes back. It's not the quality we expected. And we say, see, told you, doesn't work. And we bail on it too quickly. So got to make sure to pair the expectations and really holding that possibility for them to do good quality work and, and high level work with making sure we're providing enough training and feedback and sticking with it long enough for it to work. It's not going to be a light switch thing where all of a sudden they're up to speed. I think the same is true for a remote employee. We need to make sure that we're providing very clear expectations and also doing the work up front to find out more about how they learn best and how are we going to you know, how can we effectively train and engage this individual? We can do a lot of that trial and error. We, we may even do it without knowing that we're doing it when we're in person. But it requires more intentionality when this person is somewhere else and you only connect via Teams or Zoom. So early on, finding out how they learn best. Is it in writing? You know, do they need their instructions in writing or are they good if they just hear it? Um, Maybe we need to be recording our Zoom or Teams meetings that they can refer back to. And then making sure we're really clear about our expectations and our guidelines to set them up for success. Yeah, so many things that can can go wrong. But if you do the due diligence and you have the patience, there's so many things to make it go right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They are all such good resources to help owners scale their business and to also scale back their own role in their business if that's what they're interested in. But it does take more, I just think it's more intentionality. That's what I always say. We ca- we got away with not being great leaders for a long time because we were in person and we could just walk by someone's desk and be reminded to think about how's that project going and to check in. But when you don't have the opportunity to walk by and get that reminder, that's where things start to fall through the cracks. So we just have to be more organized and more purposeful. Very cool. We were on a, it's a previous episode of the podcast with Joey Coleman. We were talking about um, this whole concept of in office, out of office and how uh, there's many people saying, Oh, you've got to be in the office together with each other. And, your example is right there. It's like that. That's actually a horrible thing to do. Walk over and tap on somebody's shoulder. <laughs> you know, it's the most unproductive thing that could happen in one's day. 
And so it's this idea that we can get more done in the office. Well, he's got a, he just shoots that right down Mm -hmm. completely. And it's like you say, we, we've, we've gotten away with this easy way, but it seemed like it was a good way, but actually it wasn't that great. It seemed maybe like it, it's like eating a lot of sugar. It, you, you know, maybe makes you feel good for a little bit, but it's not doing you very good right. long term. And so it's such an interesting concept that's been coming up on the podcast and you've brought it up again around this, like really embracing it. It is here to stay. It can be very valuable, but there's work to be done, different ways of thinking about it for sure. Yeah. Making sure they don't go out of sight, out of mind. That Especially if you have team members who are local or in the office, that's a risk. Now, if your whole team is virtual, much easier to not forget about them, right? You have to engage with them. But I think we need to look for opportunities to create that relationship on purpose and get on camera with them, build the relationship, treat them like a person, not just, you know, somebody that you're emailing and never really get to put a face to the name and the voice. Um, Again, just more intentionality. But yes, it's here to stay. There's so many benefits to it. And not to mention that it opens up the hiring pool so significantly for those who are looking to bring on new people. That's right. This whole concept, introvert, extrovert, ambivert. I don't know that we've talked much about what the you know benefit or where either of those have strengths in a virtual remote world. But I'd be curious to get your take on, because our industry definitely has people that would classify or say, yes, I'm more introverted. I prefer to, you know, I get energy from being uh, on my own or working, yeah. you know, uh, on uh, in smaller groups or something along those lines where versus the opposite. Uh, I'd love to know how you, or what you've seen through people that maybe are a bit more introverted working in a remote situation. Has that been a good thing? Has that where, you know, were they able to shine or has it been challenging? Yeah, I think they loved it. Um, My husband is a big introvert. He loved the pandemic. He could have done that forever. And I was miserable. (laughs) I really was missing people. Couldn't wait to get back out there. So I think it has really suited some individuals for whom being in the office and being in conversation or being interrupted and all of the social components was really challenging. And on the flip side of that, some extroverts are really sort of banging the door down to get back in the office at least a few days a week because that really helps them to stay connected and feel engaged and feel a part of the team. And from a leadership perspective, surely there's a lot of leaders in this profession who are introverts and that. I don't see that as a downside at all. I don't think that that's a certainly not a character flaw. It's certainly not a limitation to being a great leader. But one of the things that I've found those individuals have really had to do, even in a virtual environment, is still work to protect their time and their energy throughout the day. Because doing something like this, being on a video call, is also quite draining for a number of reasons. But Mm-hmm. you know, especially so for different. an introvert. So yeah. really looking at scheduling your day very intentionally to maybe limit the number of calls or meetings you're part of, making sure you have sufficient breaks in between those meetings, and maybe picking the time of day. I've got some people that I work with that know that these types of calls really drain them. And so they don't do them until the end of the day, once they've already kind of been productive and they've gotten the most important things done. Then they'll do this at the end, knowing they can sign off for the day. So there's certainly different things you can do to help yourself to thrive, right? Regardless of how how you get your energy. Yeah, most definitely. And so the Zoom thing is definitely uh, an, an interesting... I, I still find it, it's, I haven't quite pinned it all down yet, but there is something about Zoom that is uh, very, very different than meeting in a regular in a regular instance mm-hmm. and 
And I don't think we've all figured out exactly how to, you know, it's one thing if it's a small group, it's one thing if it's, you know, really know everyone really well. There's differences to what it takes. Like it's almost like cameras always on, whereas it might just be in my own head, but in a meeting room, it's focus isn't always on me, but in a Zoom meeting, the focus is always on me, <laughs> even though there might be no focus, right? So that in itself, just from a mindset perspective, is causes the brain to actually have to be on in a different way, I find. Uh, that's how it affects me anyways. I'm not sure if that's the way it is for others. But I, I grew up with the telephone and talking to people. If I wasn't with them physically, mm -hmm. I was just hearing them, right? So it was, that was it. And, and so going to video for myself was always just not my preferred, it wasn't hard to do. It just wasn't my preferred, preferred channel, ch channel, even with the podcast, you know, we're doing a bit more video. I find I'm getting back, I'm getting more used to it, but definitely it's, it's different when it's on video versus just completely audio. You know what I think it is for me? And I don't know if, again, I don't know if this is how it is for everybody, but I just, if we were sitting in a room and we were having a conversation or we were in a meeting and I'm there in person, I can't see myself. So I'm just there sort of observing everyone else. I notice like when I can see myself, it's more, that's almost more of a distraction. It's like, oh, you should smile. You look grumpy or you, right? And so I'm monitoring how I look <laughs> yes. and how I'm showing up. Plus I'm trying to stay engaged and present in the conversation. <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. But it makes me laugh because I actually know someone who for a long time doing videos is like, that's all he would focus on is himself. <laughs> it just made me think of that. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. So narcissism uh, for <laughs> yeah. those, it's like, this is the best thing that could ever happen. I get to watch myself. Um, but I, I think it's, that is, it's a massive distraction. And I find like I, when I'm talking on the phone, I could be walking around, I'm looking up at the ceiling, I'm thinking, I don't feel comfortable doing that mm -hmm. on video. So I think that's, for me, that's part of it as well. But definitely seeing and judging myself, the video, right? Is there, uh, you know, now I can see, is there leafy greens in my teeth? I right. don't, don't need anybody to tell me. I can do that myself. <laughs> that's true. So, so interesting conversation around introverts, extroverts, and I guess we'll see, like, we're just so early into this Zoom thing. And even though it seems like we've been here for a while, we haven't. Uh, it's only been a couple of years. Well, I guess it's it's getting on, but heavy duty for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see, we'll see where that's going. You know, we've, we've brought this up in other episodes, but AI. I'm curious your take on AI and how, like, for the people that you're working with, are they talking about it? Are they utilizing it? Are they scared, uh, afraid of it? Uh, what's what's happening there? It makes my brain hurt, so I try to not get too far involved in it. But one way that one component of it that I heard that sounds really useful, I'll just share an example. I was talking to a friend who is a shareholder in an accounting firm, so he's been successful. He's moved up in his career. And one of the things he learned now in this newer role is that he's not a great writer. He loves the numbers, but to write a memo or to write a financial statement or to write more, more so on like the technical memo side, he really struggles with that. He's, he's just not confident with his writing. So he has utilized chat GPT to start writing the first draft of technical memos like that. And he goes back and does a thorough editing and fact checking and all of that. He still is very much standing in as a subject matter expert, but it's saving him a lot of time on the front end that otherwise he would probably stew over, you know, how to word this correctly or how make sure I'm sounding intelligent in this memo. And um, so that was an example of a way that I think it can really be a resource for us, help us to work smarter and save time and to leverage our own strengths and support ourselves in the areas where we're not as strong. But I don't think at least currently, you know, we've seen it can't fully replace the human being the subject matter expert. So we do have to come in and still check on those things. So Absolutely. It's so interesting. And uh, I would agree there's some real, real benefits from it. 
just from the example that you used, um, I'm seeing it integrate with a lot of the tools that we we use, and and that's one of them. Which is okay. There's all this information. One example is a, um, a summarizer tool, right? Mm. It's like okay, here's a you know to do meta meta descriptions on the website. It it just basically says okay. It just figures it out. <laughs> it's like computers. And when you think about it, it's like Google is a computer and it's the one that's going to be reading that thing. No, nobody else reads the meta description. Uh, And so it's like, yeah, let AI write the meta description. You know, it's a whole web page of content and it writes what it thinks is the best. And then it needs Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of editing. But there's some very big productivity gains as companies, the software and apps that we use, integrate these into the tools that we use. So yeah. just just curious. It's really early. There's a lot of fear about it. I've I also we're getting, you know, people saying, oh geez, is it secure? Is where's that data going? I put that mm-hmm. question in. Who's seeing that? Who has access to that? And I don't know that any I've heard both sides of that. I've heard that, oh no, the what you put into it, it stays private, but you know, who knows? But there's a lot of fear around it. Some lawsuits have been reading about some uh, you know, this whole concept of Whose information is that? Right. That it's feeding off of. So be interesting to get your take. And a year from now, geez, yeah. there may be something completely new and uh, AI will be old news. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I know it's moving quickly. It's moving very quickly. Well, Aaron, I, I love the conversation. I'd love for you to tell us just a little bit more about where, if people were interested in getting more information about some of the new programs that you've launched mm-hmm. or yourself, let, let us know the best way to go and get access to that. Absolutely. Well, you can check out my new and improved website. I'd love for you to go see that. It's a wellbalancedaccountants.com. And there's a lot of free resources on there, including a remote readiness checklist that you can download and sort of evaluate how you're doing in different categories in terms of being remote ready. Um, Lots of other tools. There's a great leadership reading list available for you there too. Um, recommended books that I think every leader should read. So those are a couple of things that you can find on the website. So that's the best place to find out more. Beautiful. Well, our, our, of course, we'll have all of those links in the show notes. And Aaron, again, thank you for your generosity coming on the show and sharing your expertise with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. The pleasure has been all ours. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. To learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.